Uh, first of all, uh, I must say that the announcement that Torsman made uh, this morning about uh, the new trainer for the U US Air Force uh, made uh, many of you very happy and makes me very sad. <laughs> because the major competitor in that uh, deal uh, was an Italian plane, uh, and it was a Macchi plane, and I've been working for Macchi for many years. And so having lost this contract uh, is uh, ah, something sad for my heart. Having said that, I thank you for being here. Thank you for the, the invitation. Uh, I start saying that I'm here to learn and not to teach. So what I'm going to do this morning is to give you an overview of the airplanes, either museum airplanes or uh, uh, monument uh, airplanes or just wrecks uh, that are in Italy. There are many of them. I will introduce you a, a research that I made in, in this field. Um, and I will also give you a, some examples uh, where we can, uh, is food for thought, I mean, where we can think and I tried to find some correlations between uh, different aspects of those airplane. So, all airplanes, either military or commercial, are designed to live most of their operational lives in the open. Now, of course, 100 years ago it was different. But now, as long as they are operational, they fly, stop, move around, uh, uh, they live in the open. And they live uh, in polluted areas, because you know airports are polluted areas. Uh, when they fly high, it's chilling cold. When they come down in hot climates, uh, there is a big difference in, in temperature. And they do this uh, for 25, 30, 40 years for some military planes. What makes the difference is the word operational. Because as long as they are operational, they are maintained, they, uh, they are checked, uh, uh, they are repaired. But when they go out of active service, they become uh, a little bit uh, a problem, a bulky problem, usually. Uh, this is Davis Mountain, as if you may, can easily imagine. In this picture, you see 49. B-52s. If you imagine how big is a B-52, imagine 49 B-52s. And this is just a, a, a small part. If they are not lucky, they go to the scrap dealer. Is they, if they are more lucky, they go on a roundabout. You, in Italy, at least, on a roundabout. In the middle, there is an airplane. Sometimes very nice, like this uh, G91, uh, sometimes worse. Uh, if they are very lucky, they become uh, uh, a gate guardian, a monument, whatever. In Sweden, they also become a hotel. <laughs> mm? And if they are very, 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 very lucky, they go into a museum. And now, I want to introduce you uh, one example that for me is a worldwide example of conservation that's not in Italy, but is very close to Italy because it's in Switzerland and actually approximately 150 kilometers north of the museum I am, where I am a conservator. This is a Convair Coronado 380. Uh, it's a kind of VC8. And uh, it belongs uh, to Swissair, maybe you can read it. Uh, and it flew for many years for Swissair. When it went out of service, in a matter of days, uh, it, was, uh, it went from the active uh, passenger carrying life uh, to the museum in Luzern. Luzern is a small town on a lake in Switzerland. And it has been there since 
I was there uh, by pure chance for, for the second or third time um, in the month of June. These photos were taken in June of this year. As you can see, the, mm, the airplane is mounted on plinths. Uh, it is very well maintained. Look at the interior. The interior is absolutely perfect. But there is one reason. The whole airplane is air-conditioned. It has been air-conditioned since the very first day it was put in the museum. Um, I think that Piotr remembers, or remember yesterday, that under the airplane there was a big air-conditioning equipment. Now it's under the floor, but the principle is the same. Uh, the seats uh, were the original seats. Uh, there is no smell of mold uh, inside the airplane. The air conditioning goes also into the, the, the wing uh, uh, structure. All the external joint, uh, you can see the black line. This is a caulking material, a sealing material that seals all the exterior uh, possible uh, ways for water to go inside. Uh, this is another picture you see on the sides. Uh, so every single line of joint uh, of, the, of the sheet metal is sealed. And uh, very simple but very effective, uh, on the upper part of the wings uh, where there are the joints or where the flaps and the ailerons are, uh, are situated, they just take that aluminum tape, 3M aluminum, aluminum tape, and put this tape uh, over the joints. This seals completely the joints, uh, and they did it since 1975, uh, and it works. It's not by chance that this same airplane has been sighted. Uh, I suppose you are familiar with uh, the book written by by Bob Mikesh, the former conservator of the Smithsonian Institution, uh, sorry, for, of the National Air and Space Museum in the US. He, he cited this uh, airplane as an example of good conservation. In my opinion, this is uh, very simply, very straightforwardly, but one of the best examples to be followed. One more thing. What about the paint? If you look at at the photos of the, air, of the airplane, you see that it's brand new. There is a trick about that. Swiss Air is making the maintenance of the airplane. Every year, they send a team uh, of uh, five, six people, and uh, they perform, day, let's say, day-by-day -day maintenance, uh, and um, they repaint uh, a part of the airplane. There is a 10-year plan of maintenance, and every 10 years, uh, the whole plane uh, is uh, repainted. So they paint one wing one year, the year after they paint the other wing, uh, the year after they paint the upper fuselage and so on. But every 10 years, there is new paint. I spoke with the conservator and I spoke above all with the people making the maintenance. And they say that uh, one of the tricks of the perfect conservation of this airplane is that the layer of paint uh, remains intact. It's li like our skin. As long as it is intact, it's protective. Uh, when there is some creak, uh, it's, uh, it's that. Second thing they told me is be careful about humidity. Because even if you seal the whole airplane from rain and snow and whatever, uh, in, at the interior, humidity may develop. And the importance of air conditioning, not only of the cabin, but also the structure, is uh, uh, paramount importance. Of course, it has a cost, and it, does, it is not possible to make it. But this is an example. OK. Now, we finish with the Swiss style conservation. And unfortunately, we go back to reality. Uh, what you see is what we all would never like to see. 
Uh, this is the sad end of a Graman Albatross built in 1952 and it was exhibited for 30 years in a so-called museum. Mm, I can't name a museum, a place where they store in the open a World War II wood and fabric airplane. Uh, but in any case, officially, it's a, it's a museum. Uh, later, this airplane was sold by the owner. Incidentally, the owner is the Air Force. Uh, and was scrapped in 2014 because the new owner decided to scrap it. The airplane, th this is when it was lifted before uh, being chopped. Uh, the plane was more or less in pretty good conditions. Uh, look at the interior, the cockpit was complete. Uh, okay, you see the seats were a little bit uh, done, but everything was there, the instruments were there, everything. Look at the interior of the, of the cabin. It was a search and rescue airplane, so it still had the, the stretchers, uh, whatever. And unfortunately, it now it's, uh, it's gone. It was in private hands. That means it was not owned uh, by the Air Force uh, because the Air Force sold it. And the new owner decided to uh, send it immediately to the scrap deal. That's a pity. There are some mistakes. Uh, second example is another airplane of the same type. It was in an airport in Padua, and it ran the risk of being chopped as well, because the procedure was the same. Fortunately, uh, it was discovered by the Hydroplane Museum of Biscarros in France. They moved it from Italy to France. Uh, they repaired it, restored it, and now it's on exhibition in Biscarros in these conditions. So it can be done. It can be done. It has been saved from, from destruction. Now we can talk about conservation techniques, we can talk about the fact that it was in an Italian airplane, it has been repainted in US colors. But OK, fine, let's discuss about that. But in any case, it has been saved. This is the important fact, in my opinion. Uh, I would like to present you a small, mm, not very small, uh, research that I made uh, in order to find out, in Italy, how many airplanes are either in museums or in, uh, uh, as monuments, uh, as uh, my Finnish friends said before. I'm sorry, you will not read very much of that. In Italy, we have nine so-called museums. Some of them are real museums, uh, like the Italian Air Force Museum, or like our museum, or like another couple of uh, real and high-quality museums. Some of them are not like that. But 300 airplanes are preserved uh, in these museums. Um, half of them at the interior, uh, so uh, inside buildings, uh, half of them approximately at the exterior, with more or less maintenance depends. But in any case, they are in museums that is uh, more or less uh, protected. But, and here you don't see actually what, what is in it, uh, another almost 900 are uh, preserved uh, outside Outside means uh, in private hands, because they had been sold to private individuals, uh, monuments, gate guardians, uh, uh, utility things, uh, and so on. Um, some of them tried to be turned into restaurants or bars. Uh, I remember a caravel like yours uh, becoming the caravel bar. Mm for a few years, and then the safety prescriptions become so heavy that the owner had to give up the caravel bar. And it was uh, just a caravel wreck that one day was chopped. 
of course, there is no, no way. Um, out of those 900, and believe me, there are many more that I couldn't find. Mm? Uh, out of those 900, uh, 122 are starfighters. 121, so more or less the same, are G91. Uh, 75 are Maki trainers, not the one that I mentioned before. This is the grandfather of the of the <laughs> today's trainer. Uh, and uh, another approximately 50 are uh, Bell 47 family. You see the G and the J model here, uh, helicopter. Talking about older airplanes, uh, uh, the good old uh, T6 uh, Texan or Harvard uh, uh, is still surviving in approximately 45 uh, examples. And fortunately, some of them in flying conditions. Large military airplanes, uh, uh, Fairchild 119, C-130, something like that, are only 10. Airliners are only 8. OK, this is the picture, the big picture. Uh, 1,300 airplanes, approximately, are a huge number. We cannot think of preserving correctly all of them. It's, it's, it's a dream, it's a nightmare, depends in, on your tastes. But, uh, <laughs> but in any case, they are there. And corrosion is their worst problem. We all know what is corrosion. We know that we need an, an all the cathode, an electrolyte, and whatever. Uh, we all know that rust never sleeps, or as I like to say, <laughs> you, you, you remember the old, a diamond is forever, a corrosion is forever, because we cannot, we cannot stop corrosion. So far, nobody, uh, all our science, we send uh, robots on Mars, uh, we uh, fly on the, m on the moon uh, or whatever, we have not been able to find a way to stop corrosion. We can delay corrosion, but we will never be able to stop corrosion, unless tomorrow morning somebody will invent something else. Now, let's see. Given the fact that this is the worst enemy of our airplanes, uh, Let's go back to the Italian situation, because uh, I would like to examine with you the possible causes that uh, uh, lead to corrosion. Let's start from a map. Italy, as you can see, is, a, is more or less like Sweden from certain points of view. No? So if we take Italy and move it 3,000 kilometers north, uh, you have Sweden. Because Italy and Sweden are approximately 1,300 kilometers long. Uh, just to give you any, an idea, the front part of, of, uh, of Italy, the northern part where my museum is located, where Milano, where I live, is located, so this area, is uh, at the same uh, longitude as Budapest, for instance or uh, uh, Bern in, in, in Switzerland, or Nantes in, in France. So it's, let's say, Central Europe. We are not very far from Munich, for instance. The southern part of Italy, I mean Sicily, is at the, at the same longitude as North Africa, you see. So Tunis, uh, um, Casablanca are more or less at the same let, uh, longitude as uh, Palermo or Catania. So, uh, uh, quite different uh, climate. In the north we have uh, snow, cold, humid, uh, uh, short days, and so on. In Sicily you have uh, 
uh, the sea, the sun, uh, the high temperatures, uh, and, and, and whatever, and, and the good food. And so. uh, <laughs> on top of that, exactly like Sweden, you see Italy is in the middle of the Mediterranean, and we have 7,000 kilometers of coasts. This means that 18 out of 20 of the Italian regions are facing the sea. And we all know that uh, the sea is salty. And we all know that salt uh, is one of the worst enemies uh, of aluminum, of steel, and whatever. Uh, so, if you consider the two extremes, uh, that is, uh, cold, humid, polluted uh, in the north, hot, uh, salty, um, and so on in, in, in the south, you can easily understand why on our airplane, on our 1300 airplanes uh, spread all over the, the country, we can find corrosion. Corrosion of three major types. One is the typical galvanic corrosion, two different metals in, in contact, uh, and uh, they make a battery mm, uh, that leads to corrosion. Exfoliation. Yesterday we had some photographs with very good example of the exfoliating corrosion that starts and, and you never know where it goes. And the other one is the pitting corrosion that makes mo small mm, holes in the surface of the, of the metal. We will find all of them in a few examples that I'm going to show you. This is a G46. The G46 was uh, uh, one of the typical small Italian trainers, uh, tandem seat, one forward and the other in the rear, built by Fiat in the early 50s. We discovered one of those uh, trainers uh, in a garden. Somebody bought this, this one from the Aero Club of Milano many years ago, put it in, in his garden, and uh, uh, it mounted on, in small concrete plinths, uh, and he buried in the concrete plinths uh, the landing gear. You see the fork of the landing gear buried into the concrete, uh, and the same happened for the front forks. Uh, we recovered it in 2011, and the original conditions are, as you can see here, all the garbage from the, from the, the trees uh, and so on, for years and years remained on the plane, because unfortunately, the owner of the airplane died uh, 10 years or 12 years before we found it. And for 10, 12 years, nobody cared about it, this airplane. Uh, fortunately, uh, the, the corrosion, you, you can probably see the pitting corrosion on the top of the fuselage. There was some pitting corrosion on the wings as well. So those exposed to the garbage coming from, from the trees. Uh, you look here, the flaking paint. But I must say that, after all, uh, the paint helped uh, to preserve where it was present, to preserve uh, somehow the surface uh, is the, the job of paint, how to, to, to protect it. Uh, fortunately, we recovered that. We, our volunteers work for many months over it, and now it is in exhibition uh, at, at my museum, at the Volandia Museum, in, mm, I must say, pretty good uh, conditions. We are monitoring it because a corrosion is forever, and so even if we uh, treated it properly uh, against corrosion, uh, we always have to take a look at it. Another example. I'm sorry that my uh, new Hungarian friends are not here this morning. Uh, these are two um, airplanes, an F-84, uh, G and an F-86K that have been 
on exhibition at the Science Museum of Milano for almost 30 years. Uh, then the Air Force, uh, the owner of the two airplanes, uh, decided uh, uh, they, they had a, let's say, a bad relationship with this museum that is the best and largest science museum in Italy. And they decided to move them away from the uh, science museum. And they were moved to, to our museum. Okay, after 30 years in Milano, a two million people city, terrible problems of traffic, pollution, acid rain, and whatever, believe me, the two airplanes were almost new. We did not make any protective treatment, just some, some waxing uh, or something like that, uh, cleaning, of course, but we didn't touch the paint, we didn't touch anything. So the conservation of the two airplane was fantastic. In the open, in, in a city uh, close to a river, by the way, to a canal. Uh, but in any case, it, they were in perfect conditions. Another example, this is an F-104. F-104 in southern Italy, Bari. Bari is in Puglia. Puglia is the heel of the Italian boot. You know? So in front of Albania mm, on the Adriatic Sea. Uh, we have been shown this uh, F-104 by, by the Italian Air Force because the, uh, we asked the Italian Air Force to, to have uh, an F-104 for our museum. And they proposed this one. Uh, you can see it's on plinths, uh, uh, close to the sea, behind the building that you see here, that is 50 meters, on the other side there is the shore and the sea. This is the Aero Club of, of Bari, uh, and these are the conditions of the airplane. You see that around uh, the edges uh, there uh, and under the paint there is corrosion coming up. Uh, if you look at the landing gear doors, look on the sides of the landing gear door, they are all corroded by salt, because the airplane has been there as a gate guardian for years and years and years. The uh, fiberglass dielectric uh, parts you see on top are all gone. Water is creeping through them. Uh, the, the cone uh, of the radar has the same type of, of damages. And these are the typical conditions uh, of airplanes uh, that are stored for a long time without protection close to the sea, especially in a hot climate. You see the te uh, a Texan that is not very far from, from the F-104. Apart from the fabric, of course, the fabric with sun for a long time becomes brittle, but it's easy to be replaced. But in any case, uh, corrosion from the sea salt uh, is very, very heavy, especially in hot climates. Another is example, this is the Italian Air Force Museum in, uh, on Lake Bracciano. You see that behind this airplane there is a lake. Uh, this is the place where the albatrosses, uh, search and rescue of the Italian Air Force, uh, were based for many years. And you also see the crane that put the, the, the airplanes from the water to the ground. Um, this airplane has been on display close to the, uh, after 25 years of service, uh, close to the lake, and it is still in very good conditions. From time to time it's being repainted uh, in the same colors with the same paints and so on. And it, it is in pretty good conditions, actually, even if it's in a humid environment. But it, it is maintained. Another example, this is a Fokker S11, built in Italy as Mackie 416. Uh, this is a fuselage that we recovered one year ago. Uh, in a scrap dealer. Uh. 
it was demobbed in 1966. It went to an Arrow Club uh, till the 1980 and became a gate guardian in an apartment building. <laughs> it, it's very strange. Uh, we recovered it and we found out that the conditions of the steel tube uh, is pretty good from the exterior. Just some rust here and there, but it's uh, reasonably good. Mm. On the other hand, uh, the, the windscreen structure, the one that's in front of, of the pilots, uh, had heavy signs of exfoliation. And this is typical of the material that was used uh, in the 50s and 60s. It was the 7075 aluminum alloy that was very popular at that time because it was lighter than the 2024 and uh, apparently it was more uh, sturdy uh, and so on. So exfoliating corrosion and pitting corrosion on uh, an airplane that has been left out to the elements for many years. On the contrary, this is a Russian small airliner, the Yak-40. This Yak-40 was built in 1973 and since 1998, that is almost 20 years, parked uh, at the Linate Airport in Milan. So between the runways uh, in the middle, there is this plane since 20 years left there because there was a customs problem, the company went out of business, something like that. We have been inspecting, uh, mm, we made an inspection in May 2017, that is um, one and a half years ago, and the airplane was locked by the customs uh, for 18 years. So it was blocked there and nobody entered. It's a real time capsule. The interior were the day when somebody said, please go out and lock them. Uh, <laughs> bottles of water, uh, an umbrella, uh, the, the blankets, uh, uh, the pillows, uh, whatever you, you can think of having in an airplane, except people, of course, uh, um, was still there. Look at the cabin. Look at the right place. You see the earphones uh, of the co-pilot are there. So nobody touched them for 20 years. <laughs> it's 100% complete. You see the, uh, uh, the pans here, the, the, the earphones, uh, uh, there was a toolbox inside, uh, everything was still there. And on top of this, uh, uh, the, condition, the conditions uh, were very good, you see that there was no mold, no thing, just a small smell because of course uh, humidity I I is inside, but acceptable. Conditions of the airplane after so many years uh, in a highly polluted area because in the middle of an airport with uh, hundreds of airplanes going up and down every day were and still are fantastic, fantastic. Uh, no sign of corrosion, mm, relatively no sign of corrosion. Um, here you cannot actually see the details, uh, but believe me, the wings, the fuselage have uh, absolutely no corrosion. Uh, the flaps area is fantastic. Uh, no, this is another airplane. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic and apparently it's ready to go. I see it was built in 1973, that is uh, only 45 years ago, but it, it lived uh, those 45 years uh, in the open and in an heavily polluted area. Uh, final example, MiG-15. This MiG-15 is uh, uh, a former Czechoslovakian Air Force uh, uh, example. It was bought by an Italian private individual 
uh, in the in the early 90s uh, brought to Italy and then for some reason it was left disassembled uh, on the grass. We were talking about grass now with Piotr yesterday. It was left on the grass without any protection. It was resting, uh, the wings were resting on the wing pylons and you can see the result. Uh, the, the fuselage uh, was put on the grass as well and you can see the results. Look at the front lid uh, of the air intake. You see the holes here. Uh, because there was for 10 years it was left there and humidity, water, uh, snow, rain, whatever, creeped into, into the, 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 the aluminum structure and ate it up. The rest of the plane, what was not in contact with the ground, uh, was and still uh, is when we, we got it, uh, in very good condition. You see here the, the, the check uh, uh, round uh, uh, the, the, the fin of the airplane, uh, no real sign of, uh, of damage, and actually when we restored it, uh, no real sign of damage was found. Uh, the nightmare was the canopy. The canopy, uh, the transparency was no longer transparency, and above all, the structure was steel. Uh, the, the front uh, windscreen was uh, aluminum, as you can see, but the canopy itself uh, has had a steel structure and it was all eaten up. You see, here you see that seems not very good, but from the interior, that is, rust started from inside, not from outside, the interior is non existent. And actually, uh, I was talking yesterday with Pio Piotr and said, don't you have a, a spare canopy for us? And he said, no, unfortunately. Um, now it has been restored. It is on exhibition in our museum. Uh, I cannot enlarge, but you see that the, the damage here has been repaired. I will show you later in a few moments uh, which were the conditions of the belly of the, of the airplane. There were holes like that, uh, unbelievable. But the rest of the, of the airplane was very well preserved, uh, with the only exception of the parts that were in contact with the ground. So, in a few words, uh, what kind of lessons we can learn from the previous experience? The first is that Sun and the salty environment together are the worst enemies for a structure. This is an example of <laughs> um, sun and salty environment. <laughs> Do not follow this example for the conservation of your airplanes, uh, even if the background is fantastic. <laughs> Second, this is the belly of the MiG-15. Rainwater trapped inside airplanes. Uh, and be careful, especially when gate guardians, uh, monuments and whatever are put in this attitude because it's very nice. Rain comes down, gets in, comes in the tail, stays uh, and eats up the tail of the airplane. And if you put it like that, go eats up the wing. Uh, if you put it like that, eats up the, the, the nose, uh, depends on the attitude. Um, so air, um, water trapped inside uh, is a real danger. Drill holes and keep them uh, uh, open so that water can drain down. Remember that the fuselage of airplanes is made of ribs. Ribs are watertight. If water goes here and your plane is made like that, uh, water stays here and the next rib will have more water. So you have more places where water stays. Uh, condensation. Condensation is a re the real enemy 
of airplanes uh, preserved in the open. Uh, look at the canopy. The canopy is full of humidity. And the same is the rest of the airplane inside. So we can do whatever we want on the outside. We were talking about painting with uh, car paints, airplane paints, uh, water paints, whatever you want. OK, you can preserve the exterior. But the interior is where corrosion starts. What can we do about that? Yes, the Swiss make air conditioning and so on. Can we air condition all our monuments and gate guardians? Not. But we must be aware that some kind of protection has to be done at the interior as well. Otherwise, your aluminum will disappear. Corrosion will start from the interior. A bit of technicalities. 7075 alloy, very popular in the 50s and 60s, uh, and still is actually. Uh, but with the time, very dangerous. Um, this is something I found on the internet, uh, it's not my, my job. But you see that this is time the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and so on. And these are the major type of uh, aluminum alloy produced in those uh, uh, period. The line uh, is the separation line between thin products, typically skins, uh, and thick products, structures. Uh, wing spar, in Italy, wing spars were in the 60s, uh, were all made with 7075. A wing spar is a thick structure. Uh, you see the corrosion resistance. Uh, high is blue, green is medium, yellow is low. 7075 T6 uh, was the, the first uh, alloy used. Uh, it is a low corrosion, uh, corrosion resistance. Started in 1945, approximately, but it was used up to the 70s. And this is the result. Uh, you see, it's very sturdy. This is the, the strength in, in megapascal, very sturdy. And that's the reason why it was so popular. Uh, but from the corrosion point of view, uh, it's a nightmare. Um, on thick products, uh, you see that um, even, even most, the most modern alloys, uh, 7150, 7055, and so on, still have a medium corrosion resistant, not a high corrosion resistant. And even today, 70,000 mm, 70, series alloy are still used uh, because of their lightweight and relative uh, strength. Uh, the type of corrosion preferred uh, by 7075 and family uh, alloys uh, is uh, exfoliating corrosion. The one wet that we have seen yesterday in a very nice uh, photo mm, given by Piotr. Uh, you see it when it, it, it is started under the, 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 the skin, under the, the, the paint. Uh, and the, then you scratch, scratch that, and you never find the end of it, because it's in the grain of the, of the, of the alloy. So if you have airplanes made uh, uh, with 7075, uh, uh, you must expect some problem from this point of view. Another thing I have seen is that American and former Soviet Union airplanes uh, produced in the 60s and 70s, uh, if they are preserved with a minimum of maintenance, uh, are resistant to surface corrosion. Uh, this is our MiG-21, left in the open for many years and so on. There was no pitting corrosion on the top surface. The MiG-15 uh, on the lower part was heavily corroded. On the upper part uh, was in pretty good conditions. So <laughs> if it's not really mistreated, uh, uh, this type of airplanes uh, resist very well. You remember the example I made for the two F-84 and F-86. 
They stayed outside for 30 years, no damage at all. Italian airplanes of the same period uh, were made with thinner materials, and so they are more prone uh, to exfoliating and pitting corrosion. Uh, cleaning and removal of, uh, of, uh, of dirt are the basic method for preventing corrosion. We can prevent corrosion, we can delay corrosion. Keeping paint in good conditions pre prevents water from creeping uh, in, the, in the joints, or from creeping in the slits uh, in the crane that comes uh, and create the electrolytic conditions for starting corrosion. So if we keep the skin uh, uh, intact uh, in, in one piece, let's say, we help corrosion not to start. So we avoid corrosion. Finally, let me say that, on the other hand, in my opinion, I think that for us, for museums, for serious organization, the first step, and this is an essential step for conservation of historical airplanes, is uh, that we cannot be given airplanes in these conditions. Uh, I think, I, I, I'm very sorry that my friends of the Italian Air Force Museum are not here. Uh, I say my friends, eh? um, because it's not their fault. But Air Forces, airlines, private owners, should make available to museums uh, airplanes of historical or technical significance when they are just out of the active service and not wait until they are reduced like this DC-6 uh, to a scrap, uh, to a wreck, uh, whatever you want to name it. And above all, when they are reduced to empty shells. We are grateful to Alitalia, the Italian flagship airline, because when uh, they finished to use this uh, DC-930 as a training aid for their crews, they told us, do you want this DC-9? And we were very happy because the DC-9 was brand new because it was a training aid and they kept it in a hangar and they used that every, every, every day for, for training the crews. And now this airplane uh, that used to be the, mm, the Italian Air Force One, no? so it was the, the, the airplane where the President of the Republic, the Prime Minister flew in the 70s and 80s. Two popes flew on this airplane. Paul VI and John Paul II. I told to Piotr, he's very proud of having the helicopter of the Pope. We have the airplane of the Popes. <laughs> um, and now we have it on exhibition. I, I, it's one of the highlights of our exhibition. It's in the open. We don't have a hangar big enough for the, for the DC-9. Uh, but we will maintain it, we have partially repainted it before putting it on, on exhibition, and uh, we will be very careful. On the other hand, we refused the loan from the Air Force of the F-104 that you saw before. It was an empty hulk, nothing, no engine, nothing in the cockpit, no ejection seat, all corroded. Sorry, we don't want this type of thing. And this was the third F-104 in the same condition that was proposed by the Air Force to our museum. Was the end of the game, and I looked my young colleagues uh, from the Luftwaffe Museum. We are having an agreement uh, with the Luftwaffe Museum in Gatov, and Germany will give us a fantastic, splendid, brand new uh, F-104. And we are very happy about that. 
We cannot accept these type of things, and I think that no museum should be proposed this, unless it's a Spitfire. Of course, if you give us a Spitfire like that, we will take it, no? But I told you before that in Italy there are 122 F-104s on exhibition. There are perfect F-104s that the Air Force gave to I don't know who, and they are on a roundabout. And in museum, we should accept empty shells like this. No thanks. This is a C-45, another one that's been proposed to us by the Air Force. Look at that. It's a wreck. No. No. No, but it's an attitude that must change. We are desperately looking for a B747. We would very much like to have a B747. There is another problem. Do you know how much is worth a B747 when it's uh, out of the active service life? Three and a half million euros. So it's pretty difficult to convince uh, any airline to present us something that is still worth three and a half million euros. And that's another problem, let's say. I was in touch with a British company that makes, you know, disassembly and uh, recovery of all their planes. Uh, and the first question that the CEO of this company asked me is, uh, what is your budget? And I said, Budget is uh, <laughs> zero, and they say, ah, oh. <laughs> that's an issue, <laughs> and, and I can understand it was an issue. Now, final one, philosophy. We are born out of ashes, we will go back to ashes. Metals are made of ores, and we'll go back to ores. This is the philosophy that is reminded by the corrosion of metals. So we will go back to where we come from. This is a professor of the Univers University of Don't Walt. He is uh, an Indian, so probably it's Indian philosophy. Huh? But think about that. After all, it's not. not it, it's more or less true. OK. Final thought. Please. We are very active. We are here talking about conservation of our play in museums. Let's think a little bit of the 1,000 airplane that lived the hard life of the Gate Guardian. This is an F-84 that I, I took this, the, the, a friend of mine took this picture uh, seven years ago. Another friend took the picture two months ago. Vandals, rain, this care and whatever. This was an airplane. Uh, the other one is uh, a wreck. In our communities, not only in our museums, uh, we should uh, campaign towards the conservation of gay guardians, of airplane on, on monuments. I know, as he said before, uh, one is a museum piece, the other one is a monument or whatever that can be changed. Uh, but this is a logic that I don't uh, uh, agree with. Uh, if we put an airplane as a gate guardian, we should do our best to make it stay as a gate guardian for long. The habit, for instance, in the Italian Air Force is to say, OK, we have a gate guardian. When it's old and weary, we throw it away and we will get another one. This is not the type of, uh, of reasoning, the, the state of mind that I agree. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>